What's going on, everybody, fans of the GBA? My name is Monatui, your host for the GBA Season 6 Weekly Recap. However, of course, I am not alone. I am joined by my co-host, TTM Sticks. Sticks, please introduce yourself. Hi, I am TTM Sticks, and I am also a host of the Weekly Recap, so let's do this. All right, now, before we get into the first week's matches, I'm just going to be going over the changes that we will be doing for the recaps, things that will be going, um, things that will be different from this season than we did last season. Last season, it was very long. Uh, each recording ended up to be about an hour. We went over nearly every single play. That's a little bit unnecessary, so to change it up, we're going to pretty much just talk about the important plays that went on during the match, uh, talk about some of our thoughts, uh, things that we think were significant. Uh, we understand that a lot of people last season were not entirely happy with the format of the weekly recaps, and I agree 100%. It was long, it was tedious, and it could get boring at parts, so we're going to try and shorten that up. We're going to make it more compact, and we're going to make it more enjoyable. So without further ado, let's get into the first match that we're going to go over. The match between Cooper and the Utah Jasmine and Lars of the Barusha Don fan. Cooper bringing his Mega Gallade, Clefable, Sableye, Gliscor, Staraptor, and Claydol, whereas Lars brought his Landorus, Incarnate, Aromatisse, Crawdont, Drodigon, Shaman, and Sizzle. Uh, so, I guess let's just talk about it. Uh, what do you think were some of the key plays that went on during the match? Well, really, I mean, just from team preview, I immediately saw that Utah had zero switch-ins to Crawdont at all. Whenever that thing got in for free, something just completely died. And so, really, I thought the match came down to how the Crawdont was handled, and ultimately, in my opinion, the turning point was the untimely crab hammer miss on the Clefable that allowed it to be taken out by a Moonblast. Definitely, that was huge. Um, I believe Lars's Crawdont to a KO'd everything on Cooper's team uh, would have been able to knock out the clay doll. Aqua Jet was going to be huge uh, for things like the Star After get damage off on that, uh, and getting rid of Clefable that early would have been really nice because it caused a little bit of an annoyance later on for Lars. Uh, did you know the Calc uh, did that? I mean, did the miss ultimately? I mean, it obviously mattered in getting damage off, but would it have taken the Clefable out? Oh, definitely. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, actually, maybe not definitely. I well, believe I mean, Lars said in his narration that it more than likely mattered, even though he knew the Clefable was fully physically offensive. Crowdon right. with that adaptability, Crab Hammer is extremely strong. Oh, of course. Uh, and Clefable doesn't have the best stats. Uh, of course, it is definitely a very good wall. Stats are not entirely amazing, but I wouldn't be surprised it would have knocked it out there. Uh, there were a couple other plays that uh, I would like to think that were interesting. Uh, not necessarily interesting, but key plays. Lars going for Iron Head on the Clefable earlier on definitely was, uh, he was definitely put into a pickle there, like he didn't have great answers to the Clefable at that point, so we really had to kind of bank off an Iron Head flinch, or at the very least get damage off on that, so it definitely was unfortunate to lose his Scizor. Bullet Punch would have been great for this match, he has absolutely no resistances, Glide Score was his only switch in, which he was forced to slack off later on, um, so that definitely would have helped him out. Um, also there was a common theme throughout this match where he was coming up just short of killing things. Oh, yes. I believe the, sure. the Clefable twice and the and the Mega Gallade once. The Mega Gallade play, I believe when he went for a Dazzling Gleam on the Mega Gallade, I believe Seed Flare was actually a better option because, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but with Stab that does a little bit more. 180 versus 160, yeah, yeah you're right. Definitely. I can understand if he didn't want to miss. Maybe he calced and uh, the Gallade was running a little bit more bulk than he anticipated, but if he had gone for Seed Flare there, and, uh, more damage would have been done, and the Rocky Helmet definitely would have been able to knock him out in combination with the Rough Skin. I know that's all hindsight, and we're not going to try and give uh, too many hindsight responses because we know how obnoxious they can be, but that is just our oh. thoughts. Um, I, do have I, guess... to say, I do have to say, early on, it was pretty sexy to see the Rough Skin plus Rocky Helmet Dredagon uh, make Staraptor lose over half its health from not even an attack. It was just all recoil, so that was really kind of cool to see early on in that game and i know dreadagon can act as a pseudo garchomp obviously not the same thing as tank chomp but yeah definitely especially with the crit it just got even more recoil damage up on itself and of course the way this game ended was just clayed all doing things for once in its life i, I really <laughs> don't i don't understand that at all but it's it I happened mean... 
it happened and we're gonna have to go with it but it did happen i was able to knock out an av shaman with ice beam on a hard switch in i believe that was a high roll not entirely positive but it was okay. definitely very close uh, i was able to outstall an aromatis which was impressive and he was able to just take a hit from lander's incarnate and knock that out with an ice beam so claydol being able to take out an uber's pokemon uh I haven't seen it take on anything else, so congratulations, Cooper. You are the first I've ever seen use played all successfully. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the next match, we had San Francisco Giantes, coached by Geo versus the New York Metapod and Dan or A Drive, whichever one he wanted to go by. And San Francisco squad was, of course, an Ente, Cresselia, Mega Absol, Ditto, Zapdos, and Nido King, while New York had Mega Altaria, Rotom Wash, Chansey, Dragalge. Flygon and Galvantula. Now, Mono, what did you first see from Team Preview? Uh, Mega Absol switchins. They don't. They don't exist. Where are they? I, I they, don't see them. They don't exist. With Mega Absol's coverage, everything is to a KO'd. I also saw Ditto could definitely be a threat because that prevents setup on a lot of things. Uh, it could also copy like Dragalge if it has T spikes. Get T spikes on his side of the field. Could even copy Galvantula. Get webs up if he has webs on it. So I saw Ditto and Mega Absol being able to put in a lot of work. Uh, Cresselia also would be obnoxious because it's just a great switch into pretty much everything Dan has. Cresselia is just obnoxious in general. Absolutely. I mean, it's a one-mon uh, defensive core. Oh, absolutely. It switches into the majority of things in the metagame. Uh, personally, I don't think there's too, too much to talk about this game. Uh, do you have anything? Well, I mean, really, just the game was absolutely over i'm sorry i had to, i had to do that pun it's the week i really had to first yes introduction. yes so, yes of course wonderful. but i mean really kind of the mvp was magic bounce for me because it allowed absol to set up on chancy and rotom while those guys couldn't do anything in return except for a seismic toss and then a weak volt switch or hydro pump which would not have taken the absol out Absolutely. Uh, Geo definitely... You just did it too. <laughs> Geo absolutely... <laughs> Geo used his Absol pretty much perfectly, uh, waiting for the right opportunity to set up against one of Dan's more passive Pokemon, pr preferably the Chansey, because that's all it could do, just get off Seismic Toss on the Mega Absol. And after an SD, absolutely nothing took a hit. Uh, Mega Altaria went down to play rough, and pretty much everything just went down to knockoff and sucker punch. So definitely very good job to Geo. He was kind of in control the entire time. There wasn't too much like high tense moment, uh, but it really shifted in his favor as soon as he got Mega Absol in against that Chansey. And there's and there's really not too much else to say about it. I really did like one play that I was kind of overlooked and really didn't come to my attention until a little bit later. When the Galvantula was in on the Absol, Absol is obviously faster in its mega form, so he went for Sucker Punch because the only way Galvantula would have outsped is if uh, it was obviously Scarfed, which, I mean, it, I don't think it was it. I, I don't think it ended up being Scarfed, but either way, it was taken out by the Sucker Punch, and if he had tried to play my games with a Sticky Web or something of the sort, Absol would have been able to outspeed next turn and knock it out with the knockoff, knowing that Galvantia could not outspeed in any case. Yep. Also, it was funny to see Dan not have anything for his own Mega Altaria when yeah. he became a Ditto. That was funny, <laughs> even though Geo forgot to bring happiness on it. That's, you know, it happens. But I do think that... I don't think Ab Mega Absol will be able to keep this up, but I will be curious to see how Geo is able to use it for the rest of the season. Definitely. And with that being said, we're now going to move on to the next game between George and the San Francisco Arcaniners and Battler X of the Milwaukee Saws Bucks. George bringing his Latias, Spiritomb, Infernape, Nidoqueen, Fortress, and Magneton, whereas Steve has his Mega Pinsir, Sand Slash, Golbat, Mian Shao, Hoopa, and Heliolisk. So, this game really went badly for Steve right at the very beginning. Hoopa is going to get Pursuit Trap turn 2 uh, from George, which... Pretty much for free. Like, uh, Hoopa did absolutely no damage to anything, going for a psychic move on the incoming Spirit Tomb, and just went down immediately to a Pursuit, and that was a big offensive threat, just immediately gone. And then, a little bit later on, George is going to send in his Infernape on a Pinsir, on a free switch, so it's Infernape versus Pinsir, 
And Steve thinks a little bit too late that the Infernate probably has a Cobra Berry. So he clicks Quick Attack, Cobra Berry activates, and the Pincer is going to go down relatively early into the match. And now the biggest offensive threats to George's team are just immediately gone. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think there is no better turn that was more indicative of this match than the Infernate versus Mega Pincer. I mean, you have a matchup that normally you would love to have with Mega Pincer out there against an Infernape who cannot take a quick attack even from full. I mean, it, like, it would have to be like bold, max H, whatever. Anyway, it does not take a quick attack from Mega Pincer, but Koba Berry and then Pincer just gets absolutely roasted and Really, uh, Battle X just had nothing for George's team at that point. Spiritomb was the MVP despite Latias getting more kills, though, I do have to say. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, after those few plays, Steve uh, did his best to bring it back, but at that point it was kind of too late. He was able to revenge kill the Infernape with a fake out from uh, Mian Shao, but, uh, and he made a good play later on sur clicking Surf on an incoming Nido Queen. Uh, Golbat was able to kind of put a stop to things, Whirlwind... Uh, calm minding Latias out, but it was just too heavily pressured by things like the Latias and things like the Nido Queen and the Magneton, so it wasn't able to take on the entirety of George's team. Yeah, George just executed his game plan perfectly and was able to identify his win con and really just kind of play everything out the way I think he would have wanted it to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, George preserved his win con, and at the end, he was able to just clean up with Latias, and that resulted in a 4 0 win for him. But anyway, let us jump on over to the next match between the New Orleans Pelippers for, with John as coach versus the Mew Castle United with Fufu. New Orleans brought Megalop, uh, no, Megalop, honey, Umbreon, Bisharp, Landorus Therian, Reuniclus, Latios, and Mew Castle brought Kyurem, the regular form, Suicune, Verizian, Klefki, Megabanet, and Mew. Now, what did you see from this early on? Uh, I saw a Klefki be immune to an Earthquake and then immediately be threatened with an Earthquake as the Lando T went for SmackDown. And that happened a couple times throughout the match, so that was pretty funny to watch. That was definitely really cool. Uh, very planning, good, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Very good prep on uh, both of their parts, really. Uh, particularly, John, uh, Magnetized Klefki has become somewhat standard in the OU meta just because things like Garchomp and Lando T have become relatively common. So... It was a relatively easy thing to smack on. However, Smackdown on Lando T, I think specifically for the Klefki, was just genius. I loved it. Well, I mean, he really just had a move slot to work with, I feel like, because, I mean, you have Earthquake that hits the majority, well, actually all of Newcastle's team, really. Then you have Rocks and U-Turn, and then you're able to do what you want with that fourth slot. And he decided to go, you put Smackdown on it, which was great preparation. Uh, definitely, that was very good preparation. Understanding that uh, his opponent could potentially bring something that could allow Klefki to stay in versus Landorus, because especially if the Landorus has no way to hit the Klefki, it can just set up spikes in its face, it can T-wave things that switch out. Um, so again, that was very good prep on John's part. But I don't think that was his best instance of amazing preparation as that I would have to say that goes to the Megalopony having facade and being able to clean it up, clean up with that. Oh, absolutely. That was really cool to see as well. That is a base 140 physical move coming off of a very powerful Megalopony. So that was really, really cool to see. Uh, this is a very intense match. Uh, the pursuit crit on Reuniclus earlier on was definitely very unfortunate. The Reuniclus would have been able to live the pursuit if not for the crit and had gotten and would have been able to get its regenerator back, but unfortunately it was crit and just went straight down. However, after that happens, Umbreon kinda of put on a show for pretty much everything. Oh, it took it was able to take a close combat from Verizion and just knock it out with a foul play from where it was at. Uh Bennett was able to stop it from healing using taunt, however, John was able to make the correct predictions after that so that he uh, preserve his Umbreon and be able to eventually just clean up with that, like you said, facade Megalopony. Yeah, that was just very, very powerful and excellent preparation that shone through in the end. Absolutely. Uh, this was a very back and forth match, I felt. Not even necessarily back and forth, but it was close the entire time. Oh, yeah. uh, there was one point in the match, it uh, looked like Sam was gaining momentum by pulling two doubles in a row. Um, switching out into his Klefki as 
John switched out his reunit clips and then pulling another good double into Suicune as John pu uh, pulled out his Landorus. Uh, but again, that was really the only situation in which I saw Sam ahead. Other than that, it was pretty much even throughout and it was a very, very good game to watch. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, with that being said, we are now going to move on to the next match between the Real Morel, coached by Miguel, and MV of the San Diego Chim Chargers. Miguel bringing his Weavile, Mega Blastoise, Roserade, Uxi, Registeel, and Golurk, whereas Envy brought his Jirachi, Gyarados, Keldeo, Donphan, Togekiss, and Sneasel. And this is a match with an outcome that I don't think anybody expected. I don't think anybody on the Pick'em crew picked M picked Envy to win. This player relatively new to the league format going ag going up against the former champion. I don't think anybody saw this coming, but his prep and his play was just absolutely perfect. Miguel just did not have the proper mods to take on the Jirachi. His bulk was a little bit too passive, being Roserade and Registeel that could not break a sub. Uh, Jirachi was specifically EV to make sure that a sub could not be broken from Seismic Toss, and that was really well done. He brought a Scarf Sneasel to outspeed Miguel's own Weavile, which was extremely well done. Thunder Wave Bulky Gyarados to take on Talonflame because he was not bringing Mega Ampharo, so he really had something for everything. And I think the favorite thing that uh, occurred throughout this match was seeing an SD Keldeo just kind of tear through Miguel's teams for a short amount of time. It was able to knock out the Mega Blastoise at plus two, despite that being a physically defensive Mega Blastoise. It was down to a little bit over half, and it was still able to take it out, despite Keldeo's slightly lower attack stat. And then it was able to get off massive damage on the Weavile with an Aqua Jet, which made it so that Miguel could not switch his Weavile back into rocks, and Weavile was pretty much one of his biggest win conditions. It was his best way of taking down the Jirachi, and it was essentially just taking it, taken out immediately. Oh yeah, I do have to say, the yellow color early on was disgusting with T-Waves just flying left and right. And then it really, I mean, I for having a Jirachi and with T-Waves at that plus Iron Head, I don't think this match came down to hacks really at all. I mean, it was just very much a, you were able to play the odds and nothing happened out of the ordinary, I don't believe. Uh, the only thing that I would say um, where hacks mattered, and it's hard to even call it hacks because it's a Jirachi and it's going to happen a lot, of course. is uh, the Jirachi being able to para flinch the Uxi down yeah. near the end of the game so it could not get off a foul play and break the sub. And breaking the sub meant that uh, Miguel could have gone out into Weavile, I mean, and uh, MV didn't really have a great switch in. I so. do think that statistically it played out because the Uxi was able to break out the first time MV tried to do that and break the sub with a foul play. So I, I mean, it might have happened a little bit more. I didn't count the exact number, but I still think that it played out relatively according to the percentages. Yeah, that's definitely true. And just to add a little bit of insult to injury when he didn't really need it, the Custat yeah. Barry on Donphan was pretty... That was impressive prep as well, knowing that as soon as he got to a low amount of HP or as soon as he hits 30, he'd be able to either get up rocks or just fire off a massive hit. So uh, this was a very, very well-prepped and very well-played match uh, in MV's favor. He definitely impressed a lot of people, including myself. Uh, obviously, I know he is an incredible battle in, battler in the standard play, but uh, MV is relatively inexperienced in the format, but it really shows that he knows what he's doing, and he is a serious threat to be considered. See, when you said uh, adding insult to injury, I thought you were going to talk about the crit flinch in the second to last turn on the Golurk. But, I mean, it, it obviously did not matter at that point because Jirachi had a sub up and he had plenty of Pokemon to deal with it, but it was still, still just kind of a oh, hey, here's a Jirachi that's going to hax you one last time on the way out. <laughs> anyway, let's go on over to the San Jose Sharpedos, uh, coached by Tom versus the Pittsburgh Piratitas, coached by Tup. And admittedly, when I first saw the team, I thought it was like, I thought it was the Pittsburgh Pi Patrats or something like that. But anyway, San Jose has the Zatu, Jellicent, Cobalion, Machamp, Starmie, and Mamoswine, while Pittsburgh had the Excadrill, Tangrowth, Heracross, Mega Pidgeot, uh, Hippowdon, and Azelf. And really, it was just not good for San Jose early on as the Icicle Crash miss from Mamo led to Tangrowth being able to pick up an early KO while also being able to weaken the Starmie to near Rock's percentage. Admittedly, 
uh, Grass Knot Zatu was able to heavily damage the opposing Hippowdon, but a cool roar play was able to bring Pidgeot uh, in, who proceeded to Mega and immediately nab a kill on the opposing Zatu. Yeah, definitely. I'm not. I forget if Tup knew uh, was hoping that that would happen, or he just forgot that Whirlwind got Magic Bounce. But it worked out for him anyway. It was really yeah, cool to see. Cool. Yeah, it did definitely look cool. It, you know, it was one of those, you know, kind of happy accidents, but you play it off like you did it on purpose, because then you look so much cooler. <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, once he got sent out in a Mega Pidgeot, uh, Tom did not have a great switch in, and it just clicked Hurricane, and Zatu just fell over, which was actually pretty impressive, because Zatu is not the frailest thing on the planet, and that was a yeah. very impressive thing uh, to take down. Uh the match uh, was relatively hacksy on both sides uh, oh, later on. Hippowdon got frozen by Machamp's Ice Punch. Not entirely sure how big that was for him because it looked like uh, at that point Tup was in the driver's seat anyway. But, you know, it definitely helped out on Differential and it definitely helped take out that Hippowdon, which could have potentially walled the Machamp if not for the freeze. Uh, he also got some Cursed Body hacks going his way that helped him out a little bit, but definitely not enough. Uh, Tup's Tangrowth was able to beat the Jellicent 1v1 easily, and afterwards it was even able to take a Life Orb Starmie's Ice Beam and survive on a little bit amount of HP as Starmie went down to the Life Orb recoil. So, and really at the end of the game, Ta Tup just had to sack off his Heracross to get a free switch and a Mega Pidgeot, and there's no planet in which Machamp is going to live a hurricane from that thing. Oh, of course. I mean, I do... The only thing that could have potentially taken on Mega Pidgeot, and it did multiple times throughout the game, was the Jellicent. But unfortunately, Jellicent was just a little bit too pressured going into the late game to where it just was not able to take on the Pidgeot any further. And like you said, the Tangrowth was able to take it out, thus pretty much sealing uh, Tom's fate in the end of it. Yep, absolutely. And even then, uh, the Jellicent was not able to do a lot of damage to the Mega Pidgeot. Even with Scald, even with the Burn, I believe it still would have done about like under 50%. And the Pidgeot could just keep roosting on that thing until uh, I was at a reasonable amount of, mouth, amount of health to either U-turn out or spam Hurricane some more. Yeah, I was curious, though, when I saw Jellicent use Trick Room, I thought that things might get interesting, but as it turned out... Uh, Tup was just able to use that against Tom in order to get some heavy damage off on the Koba Lion with Tangrowth uh, out, being able to outspeed it. Yep, absolutely. There isn't too much to say about this match either anymore. Uh, there was a relatively hacksy match, still definitely entertaining to watch. Uh, the Mega Pidgeot was really cool to see uh, put in work. I've always wanted to see somebody use it, and I like seeing it used effectively. And now, moving on, we have the match between Chimpact of the Philadelphia Scizors and Gubstastic of the Arizona Deoxys. Ch Chimp brought his Mega Diancie, Steelix, Cofagrigus, Tornadus T, Scalopede, and Celebi, whereas Gubs brought his Mega Manectric, Bronzong, Porygon Z, Azumarill, Lantern, and Mandibuzz. Uh, once again, I don't have a ton to talk about in this match. It was essentially just... Chim played very, very safely, very meticulously, yeah. oh. and it and it worked out perfectly. He scouted for any possible thing he could think of, whether the Mandibuzz had Steel Wing, whether any random thing had, whether anything that learned a coverage move could potentially hit something on his team, like uh, if Lantern had Signal Beam for the Celebi. Uh, it was just very, very well done on his part. If Mega Manectric had Signal Beam, so. Chimp pretty much just played this exactly how he needed to to win. Maybe not in the most quick efficient. or efficient or, or entertaining per se. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not taking anything away from Chimp Pack. I mean, you do what you have to to win. And he his prep was excellent to the point where he did not have to make any plays at all. He was just able to make the safe play every single time. And I mean, if that's how you win, you just make the plays that you need to to win. Chimp was able to identify that early and he didn't risk anything unnecessarily and that's why he was able to come out on top absolutely uh, it was so in his favor even when gubs made good aggressive plays it didn't help him out enough like when he clicked uh, foul play with his mandibuzz on an incoming diancy just to get damage off on it it wasn't enough because the mandibuzz and the rest of his team was too pressured by diancy so it was essentially just a very straightforward and slow gradual defeat for gubs how many turns did it end up being, like, 78-ish? I, I don't know, I didn't count. 
Yeah, it was it was a over 30 minute video. Go check that out if you haven't. But it was very much a oh okay. Well, I see where this is going. Yeah, get a snack. Get a couple more snacks because you're gonna need them if you want to make you it. You might need a full time. meal in order to watch that entire battle. Start just put it put tape your phone to the headboard above you while you're cooking a steak. You'll probably still be watching it by the time it's done. And on, now, onto a little bit of a quicker match. Uh, well, compared to Chimpax, anyway, I think it was, well, much less than half. Between the Atlanta Haluchas, coached by Fizz, and the Boston Red Sox, coached by Nick. Atlanta brought Vulcanian, Gengar, Salamence, Mechasizor, Porygon 2, and Rhyperior, while Boston brought Pangoro, Alakazam, Mega Venusaur, Fur Alligator, Jolteon, and Skarmory. Now, at Team Preview, I honestly thought Boston would just be completely overmatched, but they really surprised me this week with their ability to handle the immense threats threats presented by Atlanta. Well, Canyon had all kinds of problems early on as it got Sleep Powder twice, Mr. Fire Blast, and then couldn't get a burn with Steen Eruption on Mega Venu, although I think that might be somewhat considered hacks at that point. Uh, I do kind of question the wisdom of allowing Vulcanion to be put to sleep sleep and sustain heavy damage as it had the ability to put a dent into Boston's team, but Fire Blast Rhyperior shut me up very quickly as it was able to get heavy damage off of the Skarmory. But I honestly think that the match just came down to Atlanta not being able to break that Mega Venusaur who, I mean, despite not getting a kill at all, was easily the MVP of this match. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mega Venusaur just would not die. I believe it was a specially defensive Mega Venusaur meant to kind of switch into the Volcani and the Gengar, uh, the special threats on the Halucha's team. Uh, the Red Sox were pretty much able to offensively check the Volcanian pretty well. They were able to defensively check it somewhat with the Mega Venusaur. Uh, and they were just kind of able to overpower the Atlanta Halucha's. Pangoro was a very big offensive threat that pressured Fizz's entire team. Uh, Jolteon was also a very key player in this match running a uh, quick feet over volt absorb that way p2 cannot just trace volt absorb and then kill its momentum it was able to get a free volt switch on anything bar the rhyperior uh, which was not around for the longest of time so definitely very well prepped by nick a uh, bunch of little key touches that really helped him out the special defense on mega venusaur the quick feet like i mentioned and the choice scarf pangora which was just able to kind of run through fizz's team for a little bit catching him off guard at occasions and I, even a potential crisis was averted at the end when Sash Alakazam was able to take on the Scarf Mints to bring home the game. Yep, absolutely. So that is going to be it for this week's matches. And something else that we are doing a little bit differently uh, this season or this time around, uh, we are not going to be cover covering the uh, next week's matches. Uh, that is going to be done primarily by the Pick'em crew. Uh, you know, we didn't really want to overlap on content, so that belongs to the Pick'em crew. However, we are still going to be covering the current MVP race, which, as you can see, is uh, definitely uh, not what everybody expected, I think. Uh, particularly at number three. I mean, if you have Claydol and Umbreon in there, you know it, e it either has to be week one, or it's just something has gone horribly wrong with the league. <laughs> So, tied for third place with Claydol, we actually have quite a few Pokemon. We have Latias, Mega Diancy, Mega Pidgeot, and the Umbreon, all tied with three kills and zero deaths. And then for the bottom three, we also have a three-way tie with Clefagurgus, Mega Lopunny, and Tangrowth with two kills and zero deaths. So, MVP race, uh, of course, it's going to be relatively close because, of course, it is the first week of the season, but... Uh, I definitely expect things to change. I definitely expect Claydol to go where it belongs, down near the bottom some point at some point in time. Uh, but really, that is about it. Six, do you have anything to say? I just want to say that Mega Absol is currently on pace to get 60 kills this season. <laughs> All right, well, there Claydol you go. Is G on pace for 36. There you go, Geo. You got a benchmark. I'm, I'm sure you can do it. So... Thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, let us know in the comment section below how you enjoyed the new format. It definitely was a little bit easier for us to record, and we hope it is more enjoyable for you guys, the fans, listening in. So, once again, thank you guys for watching, and we will see you next week. See you guys.